Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. We're going to be looking at Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm going to be bouncing around Psalm 105. It's going to be a little bit of everywhere. I want to kind of capture a, a theme of something today. And staying with our year of generosity and fruitfulness theme, we're looking at another tree today, an almond tree, and going to get lessons from an almond tree today. And so the theme of our message is going to be about patiently waiting. So I know you're really excited to hear about the patient endurance. But it's estimated, a study was done that it's an estimated 37 billion hours that we will wait in line each year. Can you just say glory to God right now? Just turn it into a praise right now. <laughs> it's the universal frustration, having to wait for something. There's a struggle in our waiting, and especially in our society when everything is instant, right? Um, a study was done, I think it was by MIT, where they were judging uh, our, basically, our ability to wait and endure for a video to load. <laughs> and they said, after two seconds, people got frustrated and started to complain. After five seconds for waiting for a video to load, they would abort mission and say, forget it, I'm not watching it. <laughs> Is that we've become a culture of instant information. We've become a culture that is used to just getting things right here, right now. And what can happen within an individualistic culture that wants things now is we can miss out on what God is trying to do while we're waiting for the fulfillment of the promise that he has spoke to us that we could actually judge God having to make us wait as his no, not his not yet. That there's this thing that God is doing on the inside of us and there's things that God is orchestrating on the outside of us. And as God is doing something on the inside of us, preparing us for the place, he's also going ahead of us in the place to prepare the place for us. So he's preparing us, but he's preparing the place. So the worst thing that could happen was be is if his people are not ready to go into the place, hello, or if the place is not ready for the person that's ready to come into the place. It's why he goes before us to prepare a place and many times it's in the presence of our enemies. Now here's the beauty of that. When we think it's in the presence of the enemies, we feel like the mood of that is, nah, 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 I'm eating, you can't. But it's actually the invitation of God that he would do such a work in our hearts that we would even look at our enemies and go, there's room for you too to sit at the table and dine with me, that that's the attitude of him preparing a place in the presence of the enemies, that it wouldn't just be a place he's preparing, but it'd be a people that he's preparing to move us into the rhythms of God and to look like Jesus. Because what does Jesus do for his enemies? Not all at once. He dies for his enemies, that God is doing a preparatory work in you, and he'll use the promise of a blessing or a destiny in order to create in you the hope that would initiate and invite you into a process of transformation so that he would take you where you weren't willing to go to produce in you what you couldn't on your own, so that he would produce through the promise, an invitation or an initiation into something so that we would begin to be changed ourselves 
as we're moving into the destiny in which we are called to move into. And so the Lord will show up in a promise and he'll end in a fulfillment, but the space in between is us becoming who he's called us to be and the place being prepared that we're trying to come into. It's why he will allow a people to walk in a wilderness for a generation for 40 years before he lets them go in. It's why you've been circling the same mountain for 40 years, wondering why you haven't went in yet. See, you've blamed your circumstance, but you've not looked inwardly and allowed God to do the heart work. Because the grace of him on that is he won't let you go into a place that you're not ready for. Because with a bigger platform, do you think you're going to hurt more people or less people? So he's got to prepare us to be like Jesus, and he'll do it in this process of the prophetic promise, a promise of a fulfillment, and then a death to us in the middle. And so the reality is, is are we willing to endure that process? I like what the great theologian and philosopher Tom Petty says. <laughs> the waiting is the hardest part. <laughs> Some of y'all are too saved. You don't even know what I'm talking about. That's all right. We're going to work with you. But God has a waiting room. We don't like that about God. I want the promise and then I want the fulfillment right there. Like, just put them together, God, right there. Bam, I got the prophetic word and that's what we do, right? We get the prophetic word from God. God gives us a, a feeling, a something, a promise, and we immediately think we're just gonna step right into it. It's like we treat the prophetic as God's permission when the prophetic is God inviting us into the process. Come on, come on. He's trying to help us. He's trying to help us. But God has a waiting room. And if you know anything about waiting rooms, you're never seen when your appointment is scheduled. Come on now. You're never seen when the appointment is scheduled. It's even gotten more complicated now because the last time I tried to go to the doctor when I was sick, they had to test me to make sure I wasn't sick with certain stuff before I could even go in the room and wait. I'm in my car. They did a drive-by nose, up, stick up my nose. I thought they were just waiting to ask me some questions. They rolled down that window and I'm like, ah! And so wait 15 minutes. We'll tell you if you can come in. I thought, oh my God. Goodness. The appointment was to ram something up my nose. And I might not get in. And then you got to wait 15 minutes to figure out if something's wrong with you or not. So God has a waiting room. And when you get in the waiting room, you got a 1984 National Geographic you can thumb through. Or a 1972 Highlights magazine for children. You got to be old school to even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. And it uh, just feels like nobody likes waiting. And what can happen in the waiting room is I can begin to sometimes get an attitude when I got to wait. Oh, don't you look at me in that tone of voice. Y'all know y'all do this. Is that you get in the waiting room and you begin to get selfish thinking the whole world revolves around you and your time. And you begin to think you know what's going on in the back even though you can't see what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll begin to think there's a plot against your life going on in a room you can't see because you're having to wait on being seen by the physician. 
Okay, I'm going to have to just, you know, I'm just going to go with it, okay? And you'll actually begin to think there's a sabotage against the plan for your life. Not because it's not valid, but because it's not coming when you've decreed it to be. See, there's something about receiving God as God. I can't receive God as God until he crosses my will. If God is doing everything I want him to do, I can never receive him as God. It's only until he says, I'm coming in this way, even though you think I should come in this way, where I have the opportunity to receive him as the Lord of my life. So it's the divine crossing of our wills. It's the divine crossing of our timetables and schedules that we think he should come in that actually give us opportunities to receive him as he is the Lord of our life. The only thing that pleases God, are you ready for this? This is what the scripture says. There's only one thing that pleases God. Our faith. Hebrews eleven six. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God for whoever comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That he would draw us into this place of waiting for the reward, of seeking him and trusting him for the reward that would then put us in spaces where we realize we're not in control. That God will put you in spaces where you cannot manipulate him or other people to get you to quit focusing on people and get you to get your eyes on the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who is actually in control. He would move us past our own rhythms and put us into uncertainties and call us into places that are too deep for us to let us know You're not so big of an old boy, are you? Never forget, a friend of mine took the parent's car out while they were at work. Boy, we thought we was cool. And we're riding around, and we're just cutting up. We're speeding. And everything was good. Until we veered over and almost hit another car. And that car happened to be the big brother of the guy who was driving the vehicle. The car turns around, looked like something off Fast and the Furious. And then we get to looking like, oh no. Hit it. Brother catches up to us, pulls us over, takes little brother out of the driver's seat, throws him on the hood of the car, and says, you ain't so bad, are you, little boy? We went from feeling nine foot tall and bulletproof to understanding we were in a situation we weren't big enough to handle. And we had to depend upon the mercy of the stronger to let us go. And so the Lord will create these seasons and these times where you realize you ain't so big and bad as you thought you was. It's a calling into the deep to realize, am I going to trust God Or am I going to continue to try to manipulate circumstances and people to feel like I can get my way? (laughs) That the Lord is orchestrating something. He's not in the back watching a surveillance camera laughing at you. (laughs) While you're wigging out in the waiting room. 
Matter of fact, some of you have ruined your witnesses at time because when you were in line, you showed your rear end. Instead of patiently waiting and thinking, maybe God could be up to something here. Well, it got quiet there, didn't it? <laughs> Lord. See, the problem is not with our medical health care professionals. The problem is with me, that I think the world should revolve around me. When the Lord is letting us know that the prophetic promise always has to deal with the kingdom of God advancing, not my personal agendas. And it's the space in between the prophetic and the fulfillment that lets us know it's not about us or elevating us in that season. It is always about the harvest. So what if the waiting is an opportunity to show how glorious God is and a chance for God to do something really glorious in us? What if the promise is initiating us into something, an invitation into the space of transformation of ourselves and transformation of the thing we're coming into that will actually get us fitted for the purpose? And the worst thing we can do is think the waiting is a personal attack against us. Many people waiting for the promise of God to come to pass have slipped into thinking there are forces behind the scenes greater than God that are keeping them from their destiny. I want to just submit to you today, there's no force greater than heaven on the earth. And if the scriptures show us anything, it's that God will use the forces opposed to us to actually make us into the thing that he's designed us to be into. So I want to share something with you today. Um, A lesson's from another tree, the almond tree. It only shows up in the Bible a handful of times, but when it does, it It's really powerful. The almond tree in the Hebrew is the shaked. It's closely related to the word shakad, which means to watch or to wake up. Now, why would God use that reality to show us something here, and why is that? In the land of Israel, the first tree to bloom and to blossom and to put on a flower is the almond tree. So the almond tree is known, I think we've got a picture of it up here, I want to show you guys, well, maybe we do, uh, we don't, okay, that's okay, but that we have, um, that it puts on blossoms first, it puts them on in the screen, oh, it's behind me, oh, great, wonderful, uh, I lost my confidence in the monitor back there, but um, they were on it. Um, so the idea becomes is that this is the first um, tree to put on a blossom. So what it lets us know is, is that we're on the prep- precipice of a change or a new season. We're coming out of winter and things are waking up again. Things are beginning to bloom again. Things are beginning to blossom again. So it's the first tree to put on a flower in Israel. But here's the other reality when it comes to that tree. It's the last tree to produce fruit. The first tree is a sign that everything's waking up. The last tree, after everything else has produced and bloomed, to produce an almond for people to enjoy. So God would use this reality to draw us into something, to say, hey, look, I'm up to something, and he would show the the prophetic nature of a flower, but then that flower would fall off, and it would not produce until everything else had produced, and it would be the last thing to put on fruit. That God would use this as an example to his prophet Jeremiah to enable him to trust in the process that God was doing. That he would draw him into this tree that would produce a flower and then be the last thing to produce fruit. To let him in on the way that God does stuff when it comes to giving promises to his people. 
And this is what he tells Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Amen. He says, Then the Lord said to me, Look, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I replied, I see a branch from an almond tree. Now, we read that and think, what in the world does that mean? Uh, He's just seeing a branch here. Okay. But then watch what God says in verse 12. And the Lord said, that's right. And it means that I am watching. And I will certainly carry out all my plans. So, so, so think of this. Let's do it in the Hebrew here. The almond tree, the shaked, watching, shoked, shaked, and shoked. Do you see how it sounds so similar? Is that he's basically drawing him into this illustrated sermon of an almond tree and then saying, I am watching and working in the middle of your waiting. Because if you go on and read what Jeremiah is about to deliver to his people, he's about to deliver to his people that they're going into judgment. How many of you would like to get that word? Yeah. All right, Jeremiah, I'm calling you a prophet. All right, what do you want me to say? Uh, judgment is coming. <laughs> and nobody's going to listen to you. So God shows up in the prophetic flower and the beautiful thing it is. It's like uh, John says it this way when he gets the word in Revelation. He eats the scroll and he's like, oh, it's sweet as honey to my mouth. But while it's processing in my stomach, it's as bitter as can be. It's that we love to get the prophetic, but we hate the process that brings the prophetic about. It's sweet like honey when we hear his word, but it's always a process that God is calling us into to reorient our inward life, to reorient the inside of our heart, to do a renovation of our heart is painful, but it's what the prophetic calls us into. It says, here's the beautiful thing that I'm doing, but I'm calling you into this beautiful thing to give you strength to know that through the process of going through this, it's not going to fruit to a long time from now. That this is what he's showing the prophet. This is what he shows us. Have you ever got a word and you're like, oh, man, that's awesome. And you think because you got the word, you're going to step right into it. And instead of stepping into it, you take four steps back. God, why would you do that? Because I was showing you something beautiful to give you strength to understand you're going to have to endure the process before the fruit comes about. Because if you know anything, well, I better not say this. This is the live stream service, so I'm not going to say it. I thought y'all would beg me to say it. You guys are getting better. When it comes... To having children, the fun part is making them. (laughs) The hard part is the birthing process. That there's a prophetic signature on every step of life to bring us into the reality of how God works. See, I told some of you too saved. I couldn't, I, could, I couldn't be myself in front of you. But it's the, it's the idea of it all. It's that intimacy is the initiation of the process of God doing the prophetic thing that he wants to do, that God is watching and working in the waiting. He's like, Jeremiah, I'm going to show you this beautiful almond tree. Why? So that when judgment comes... And you're going to get to thinking that this people are never going to get it and you're never going to get to go back to your homeland and that the 70 years of captivity is actually going to be 70 million years of captivity. When you start to get discouraged, I want you to know that I'm watching and waiting. It's going to look like I'm not there, but I never take my eyes off the process of that thing becoming into fulfillment in which I've said it was going to come. So he says, Jeremiah, the words I'm speaking to you I want you to quit thinking of a, I spoke it and it's going to come to pass. I want you to be thinking like an almond tree. I want you to begin to think about 
a process. It's the old adage, a watch pot never boils. You ever tried to watch trying to boil some spaghetti noodles? And you get down over there thinking your eyes are going to be like Superman laser beams and you're going to... And you're at the mercy of the ability of that pan and that stove to get hot. We don't like the process of it all. But sometimes it feels like we're waiting with the almond tree. We see a flower or a beautiful promise and there's no manifestation. So we think maybe God isn't there. Maybe he's in the back room somewhere watching in a surveillance camera enjoying our squirming and are complaining. That sometimes it can feel more like candid camera. Or what's those prank guys? Impractical. See, I knew somebody wasn't saved in here and had been watching some stuff. I didn't think it was going to be the associate pastor, but... Is we think God's pulling some impractical joke on us. But God is forming us and he's fitting us to this beautiful promise that he's creating for us. I love what Psalm 105, verse 16 through 21 says, and it just can, it boils down Joseph's process in just a few verses. And it says this, when he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. You see, did you get that? He sent a man ahead of them through what path? Sold as a slave. His feet hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions. I want you to think about Joseph's life. He saw the blossom of the almond tree. He had a dream that 12 stars were bowing before him. And the sun and the moon as well were bowing before him to his star. He has a vision of sheaves of wheat and then all the sheaves of wheat, the same number of his brothers, are bowing at him. So he gets the prophetic word of, of somehow he's going to be an authority. But all the brothers could see was the power dynamic of them bowing. They didn't realize that the sheaves of wheat were actually provision. They didn't realize that the dream was about the harvest and wasn't about a power dynamic. And that's when we miss it so many times is, is that we think that it's all about an authority or a power dynamic. It's never about that. If the grace of God comes on somebody's life and God begins to elevate them, it is never about that person and what they can get. It's always aimed at a harvest. It's always aimed at provision for the people. And they didn't realize that that famine was coming. So they try to get rid of the one who's the solution for the famine that's coming because they were so short-sighted in understanding God's plan. So Joseph gets the word and he's like got his chest out like, hey guys, God give me a word. It's like be careful when you share a word God gave you with what company you're in. Say, hey guys, I got a word. Oh yeah, what did you get? Well, I dreamed uh, that you guys were bowing to me. <laughs> That's crazy. And they went from yay to oh. Their next move is to take Joseph 
throw him in a pit, and sell him into slavery. It's like the promise just raised the ceiling of this beautiful story, but the next stanza of the story, we're immediately thinking, how in the world is this going to be possible now? Here it made sense, God, but here it does not make sense that you would fulfill this. He's then sold into slavery, sent to a pagan nation in Egypt. See, the word of the Lord tested him. But there's something about the Hebrew word for neck there. The Hebrew word was very interchangeable. The Hebrew word for neck or throat, nefesh, is also means soul. So the idea could be this, that, that his nefesh, that his soul was put in a collar of iron. But all it served to do was to make his soul <laughs> into a soul of iron, which made him more resolute and stronger for the thing God was bringing him into. He is sold into slavery. He then gets to that place in Potiphar's house, and he rises again to the top. You would think, all right, now's the time for the promise to come to pass, right? Like, okay, he passed the test. He's now made it. And then the reality becomes, as he's grown into his place there, he is now having to battle the jealousies or the things in that realm of influence. So that's like what they say. How do they say it? Greater levels, greater devils. But I love what Chris Valton says, greater angels are there too. <laughs> greater angels are there too. Greater grace is there too. But the reality is, is that there, there he is fighting this again, and then Potiphar's wife makes a move on him. And he comes out of his coat. He's got this theme with coats, if you'll notice, with Joseph. I bet you he was like, quit putting coats on me. One gets dipped in blood, and I'm told I'm dead. Uh, told my dad is dead, and then you're gonna put another coat on me, and this is what's gonna be left behind as evidence that I did something I didn't do. See, Joseph would rather lose his coat than his character. Go, Joseph would rather lose his position than his character. Do you see what it's showing us? It's showing us that. Joseph's heart isn't about being in some position to lord over. That Joseph's heart is, even if I don't have this position, I'm going to do the right thing. That every bit of testing you guys are experiencing right now is to show the principalities and powers and God and yourself where your heart really is. Will you do the right thing when it gets hard or will you succumb to temptation? This is the reality of what's going on. This is the lesson God is teaching us. So he's ripped out of the coat. Potiphar's told about it. He gets then thrown into jail. While he's in jail, he then starts giving prophetic dream interpretations to those who are in jail with him. See, the circumstance he was in didn't keep him from using the gift for other people. He didn't say, I'm not going to prophesy or use my gifts anymore because I'm down here in jail. Look where it got for me. He's like, no, this is a gift of grace from God. I'm going to continue to operate in it no matter where I'm at. That here he is in this position of jail, and he gives a baker and a cupbearer a prophetic word of what their destiny was going to be. The cupbearer gets to go back just as Joseph prophesied, and then here the Pharaoh has a dream. So you're thinking in your mind, oh great, the cupbearer is going to remember and say, Pharaoh, I know a guy who can tell you dreams. The Bible says that the cupbearer forgets for a matter of years of what even happened. I don't know about you, but if Joseph in that moment, I'd have been like, man, thanks for paying that forward, big man. But this is the way we're getting to see what is in the heart of Joseph. 
When we don't get what we want, when we get it, how do we respond? So Joseph is here and he finally gets to come and the, and the cupbearer remembers, oh my goodness, how did I forget? Yes, there is someone who can interpret these dreams. He's brought up, he interprets Pharaoh's dream. Pharaoh is so impressed that he elevates him to second in all the kingdom of Egypt. And guess what? He's over all the bread and all the resources that Pharaoh had. Now guess who's back home and needs some resources? Those pesky brothers. Those pesky brothers that threw him in a hole, sold him into slavery, dipped his coat that his father gave him in blood and gave it to your father. See, that God will send the word and test us. That the greatest thing God is concerned about is not so much fulfilling the promise he spoke to you. He's more invested in you becoming like Jesus. But we put it on the fulfillment of the promise. And so while we're watching the promise saying, there's no fruit, there's no fruit, there's no fruit, God is watching us and going, You're not conforming into Jesus. You're not allowing this to conform you into Jesus. You need to allow this to posture your heart to conform you into Jesus. That we think the timetable is in God's hands, but maybe it's in our own if we're willing to repent and begin to conform into the image of Jesus. Maybe he could speed things up and give us things the way we think they should come. So you think the test is gonna break you but I've come to tell you that the test is going to make you. It's your grade. The test is showing you where you're at. And it doesn't mean we get discouraged. You know what it means? It means we're going to have to study harder. You know, the thing about study is you tend to study best when you're by yourself. That I think the studying is spending time alone with the Lord where he's downloading into you and you're learning his voice and you're downloading, you're putting his word in your heart, you're hiding his word in your heart, you're, you're, you're moving in rhythms that are more individualistic in the sense of personal time with him and then out of that personal time with him, he begins to publicly begin to bless you and begin to use you in ways and everybody's like, man, where did that come from? They must have been studying for the test. They weren't going out with friends, going to places they shouldn't be going. They were locked in a room in a secret place because they were preparing for the test that they knew was going to test the word that God had given them. I can remember as a young man, I was saved when I was 22. It was like a man on fire. I was... was, when I got saved, it was a light switch. It wasn't a sunrise. You know what I'm saying? It was like, it was there. Whoop, whoa. I thought everybody was going to hell, and I was the only one with a bucket of water, man. I was, I was hungry, man. I remember times when my friends would say, hey, man, we're going to go out and watch a movie. And there wasn't anything wrong with the movie. It was a clean movie. It was good. But I go, no, man, I think I'm going to stay home and just, I'm going to spend some time with the Lord. And it's a 22-year-old. I'm consuming 20 chapters of the Bible a day and playing Jason Upton and just pacing in my room, still living with my parents. How impressive is that? But I knew God was doing something. I knew there was going to be a test ahead. I knew there was going to be something of the, of the prophetic promises of God that weren't going to come to pass if I didn't know what it was to say no to the devil and yes to God. That there would be moments in my life where I would be confused and think I can take a shortcut by doing this, but saying, no, I've got to go the way of the Lord. I've got to go the way God is saying, but I learned to have that voice and to create that ear in my life by myself with King Jesus. That's where you learn it. It's in the unimpressive. It's where Joseph probably learned it. He learned more in the pit and the prison than he ever did in the palace. David was never more pure than when he was in a cave by himself being run away from Saul. He was never more pure then 
Because guess what happened? When he gets the fulfillment of his promise, do you know what happens to him? He starts numbering Israel, and then he starts getting eyes for Bathsheba. See, we think the place is going to set us up to be pure of heart. And I want to tell you, the place will never set you up to be pure of heart. It'll always be the process. Always be the process. Anybody that's ever fell in ministry, they didn't fall when they were in the grind. They fell when they finally got to the place that they felt like they were supposed to achieve. You're never more pure and the times are never more sweet than right now. We're waiting to get somewhere instead of waiting to become something. And that's where we miss the promises. We try to get somewhere instead of become what God has called us to be. So I just want to free you up and say, quit worrying about the promise and where you're at right now. You begin to lean into Jesus and say, am I more like Jesus today? That's the success or not success. Am I leaning into the grace of God today and allowing him to move me and change my life? Or have I put up a hard heart? said, God, you can't come this far. But this is the place that God was moving us to. Is, is what this almond tree is to realize is that this process of producing fruit is going to look more like barrenness than it will like fruitfulness. And then in a moment, there's going to be fruit but we're gonna be so caught up in our relationship with Jesus, they'll have to tap us on the shoulder and let us know that what we got, what we prayed for, and what God said came to pass. And we'll be like, what? Oh, I am what? I'm standing right where I prayed for. That ever happened to you? Where you're like, oh my gosh, that prayer I prayed that long ago come to pass, but somebody else had to remind me. Why? Because I was so caught up in the pursuit of Jesus, I didn't even realize the prayers were being answered as I became more like him. That this is what God's called us to, to be faithful while we wait for God to act. The almond tree also, I believe, is the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden. And here's why I think that, is that when God told Moses to build a tabernacle, it was a picture of the uh, mountain garden that Adam and Eve were in. It was a place where heaven was going to come and, and, and invigorate earth, and earth was going to interface with heaven, and that God was going to be able to walk with humanity. God, who is spirit, was going to be visible on the inside of his kids and his people, and they were going to flourish and, and multiply and, and make this garden basically overtake the whole earth where the whole earth was a place where heaven and earth would intersect. We know how that ended, not very well. But God never gives up on his promises. He never gives up on his people. So he calls a man by the name of Moses and Moses delivers his children, God's children out of slavery and takes them to a place and he takes them to the middle of the desert. He fills their pockets with gold and all kinds of goods. He gives them so much favor that the, the Egyptians are actually just blessing their socks off. And it would seem that, man, why is God blessing us and giving us all this money? When well, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, he tells them, hey, Moses, build me a house. See, it's just like God to fill your pockets full of money but put you in a place where you can't spend it. I knew I wasn't going to get no amen, no help there, but that's okay. I get it. I get it. See, we think God wants to fill our pockets for ourselves. It's always about a place for him to dwell. It's always about a place for him to dwell. So he's filling up their pockets. They're being blessed. The Lord says, Moses, build me a house. And this was to be a replica of the Garden of Eden. It was to have, uh, on the veil, there was pictures of cherubim and seraphim. And so there's pictures of, of the, like the reality that, that that was the sky. And it was even the color of an evening sky. And so when Jesus ripped the veil, it was like, 
God was saying, I'm ripping the sky. It was the, the prophet's decree was rend the heavens and come down. And so when the veil ripped, it was like God was saying, I've ripped the heavens the way that Isaiah was asking me to rip the heavens and rend the heavens and come down. Is that all of this was a picture of the Garden of Eden, a place where God would dwell with humanity and dwell with a people. But the only tree mentioned in that reality was an almond tree. And it was represented in a lampstand. And this is what the Lord would say about this lampstand, about this instrument that would be in the holy place and would actually light the way for the people of God to go into the presence of God. Exodus 25, verse 31 says this, And you are to make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand is to be made of hammered metal. Its base and its shaft, its cups, its buds, and its blossoms are to be from the same piece. Now watch this, verse 32. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand. Three branches of the lampstand from one side of it. Three branches of the lampstand to the other side of it. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be one branch and three cups shaped like almond flowers with, blood, with buds and blossoms are to be on the next branch and the same for the six branches extending from the lampstand. I want to show you a picture of kind of a mock-up of what this possibly could have looked like. So this is kind of the instrument. Now I want you to show, show you where the place that it was placed at was in. that the tabernacle was really compartmentalized into certain spots. And as you went further, few and few people could go. All the way up to the holiest place where only one person could go one time a year. So this idea of there's a crowd, but then it narrows to a few people, to then it narrows to one person. It's a picture of God's way of getting the presence of God instituted back into the people of God. So in this place where the, where the menorah was, where that lampstand was, was actually in the holy place. And in the holy place was an altar of incense that you can see there. And there was a table of showbread, which was 12 loaves of bread that, that was to symbolize the people of Israel being food for the nations as they partnered with God that that's where the nations would come. The blessing of God would flow through and flow out of. And then the only light that could be in the place was in that lampstand, was in that candlestick. And that candlestick was made to look like an almond tree. Three branches on each side, so six is the number of man, but one in the center, seven, the completion, would be like a New Testament reality. They wouldn't have thought this, but the New Testament reality is, is that this is the center post. This is Jesus, the light of the world. And as we are connected to that reality, we become the light of the world as well. That this was put there to run, to hold oil, and to be set on fire, and to look like a tree in order where people could find their way in the holy place and make it to the presence of God. It's why Jesus says, I am the light of the world, but then he turns around to his people and says, you are the light of the world, is that Jesus was becoming a tree of life. And not only was he becoming a tree of life, he was calling you into that reality to be a tree of life. It's why in Revelation, when Jesus is walking through the churches, they're called candlesticks. that he interprets the candlesticks as his churches. And he says, if they're not on fire and fulfilling their purpose of leading people into the presence of God, I'm gonna remove that candlestick. That the destiny of the church is to show people the way into the presence of God. Amen. Now this tree was made out of pure gold. There was something about gold in that ancient time is that there was two ways to make gold. You could make a form and then pour liquid gold into it and then that it would capture the form or you would have to hammer and forge the gold and shape it with heat and with time and with pressure 
with manipulation and building and, and bending. And, that in order to create this lampstand out of pure gold, they had to first heat it up hot enough where it would bend to the will of the one who was forging and making it. And every hammer blow was not aimed at destroying it. Every hammer blow was aimed at shaping it. And I think what happens so many times is we feel like each hammer blow is actually an attack on us and we complain to the hammer. But have you ever complained to a hammer? Why? Because there's someone holding a hammer. There's an arm attached to the hammer. And what the Lord wants to remind us is, is that don't forget whose hand the hammer is in. It might feel like a blow. It might feel like pain. It might feel like something antithetical of being shaping you to the purposes of God. But God promises that he makes all things that work for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's right. And so every hammer blow, every betrayal, every divorce, every death, everything you've ever experienced is aimed at shaping you into something that can show people how to get into the presence of God. It's what he's up to. God's trying to teach you who's in control. It's the whole message of Scripture. It's why he calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. It's a pagan king. It's why he calls Cyrus the Persian. And he's the one that lets them come back and build the temple. See, we're so caught up in political dynamics that we don't even understand who's actually in charge of the universe. Anybody that gets put in charge is put there by the Lord. Romans 13, read it. And he will use them as a judgment onto you. That it more than them, you complaining about them, is to say, no, there's something in my heart that hasn't got worked out yet, and God had to put that guy in place so that I could deal with my heart in order to deal with the issues that are in me. People don't like that kind of preaching. But I'm just telling you, God's in charge. He's enthroned above the cherubim. He's enthroned above the seraphim. He's enthroned above the principalities and powers. And he's trying to get our attention in these last days. Say, quit complaining and start praying. Quit complaining and start fasting. Quit complaining and step into your destiny and preach the gospel. Can you imagine the New Testament church complaining about Caesar? It's not in there. It's not in there. You know what they say to the powers that be? They say, you do what you got to do, and we're going to do what we got to do. And if that conflicts with your agenda, I'm sorry, but we're answering to a king of higher authority in your throne and in your rule and in your reign. Whichever way it goes, we're called the faithfulness to Jesus and to do a deep look on the inside of us, to quit looking at the hammer and start looking at whose hand the hammer's in, who's orchestrating the history of all things. I'm telling you, it's King Jesus. King Jesus, that he is calling us to be lampstands in these days that burn bright and show people here is where the presence of God is. Six, the number of man, the middle one being Christ and his church. 
that we are the branches, but he is the vine. And our father is the vine dresser. (laughs) And you've been complaining about somebody else while you're not producing fruit. Hate to tell you, the Father's the vine dresser, Jesus is the vine, and you're the branch, bud. No reason why we shouldn't produce fruit when it's all in our favor. And we've been given the Holy Ghost. That's what I said. (laughs) Game over, huh? The almond tree's a reminder that we're drawn to a place better than the one we're in. That we're drawn past our current circumstance to the better thing that's ahead. That God is watching and working in the waiting. Yeah. He's watching and he's working in the waiting. And what he said will come to pass. Take it to the bank. What he said will come to pass. Take it to the bank. You can count on that. You can count on that. So will we partner with him in these last days to see a people come to him? I believe the greatest revival of the world, it's already started. It's underground, but greatest revival that the world's ever seen is already happening. Fastest growing church in the earth is Iran. Yeah. Persecution and pressure is where we find the genius that is in us. Don't be afraid for the days to come. You remember this mantra. Here's the church's mantra. It was their first statement of faith. You know what it was? Jesus is Lord. It was the first test of who was a Christian or not. It was who's bowed a knee to King Jesus and who hasn't. It wasn't Caesar is Lord. It was Jesus is Lord. Directly opposed to the powers that be to step into a new reality that the cosmic creator of the universe is the one actually in control. And even if you murder me, his plans are still going forward. And he'll use my blood to water the seeds of his promises in order to send revival on the earth. Now that's bravery. That's courage. And he's calling us to that kind of a life.